for a global action camera that gives you that authentic point of view perspective? Well, look no further. Tacticam Fisheye has you covered at a price the other guys can't touch. Tacticam Fisheye, because that fish of a lifetime happens once in a lifetime. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Bass Tour Anglers podcast. Our guest today is fishing his ninth season on the BASS Elite Series. He's now a four-time qualifier for the Bassmaster Classic. He has 16 top 10 finishes, including a win in a Northern Open at Lake Sinclair. He's currently sitting in 42nd place in the Angler of the Year standings. He's in a good position to earn his fifth Classic invite. Chad Pipkins, welcome to the Bass Two Anglers podcast. Thanks for being with us today. Hey, appreciate it. Looking forward to it. So we need to add some W's to that list and we'll be all set. Absolutely. And, and you know, uh, one of the things that whenever I talk to an open winner, uh, let me just say, I, I don't know if there's a tougher, I, I mean, I see this in a lot of my interviews, but I don't know if there's a tougher thing to do out there than to win an open event. I, no, I, th I think you're right. I'd like to say you're right for sure, but I haven't won an elite event yet either. So those are still pretty tough to win. But yeah, those, those open fields are absolutely stacked. Now you've got guys from multiple tours trying to get in and then you add a bunch of really, really talented locals on top of that. And then you've yeah. got not a hundred guys, you've got 225 guys. So it's, they're tough to win. And it's just, it's hard to win right now. Just not really on any of those tour level events, but somebody's got to win, right? Yeah. And I just have so much respect for the Toyota series as well. I mean, there's just so many, I mean, the fields are gigantic and it's, it's a lot of boats. Yep. Yeah. And so many things got to go right. I mean, obviously if it's just a one day you can, you can swing, but in a, in a three, four day format, I mean, you got to have a plan, you got to be ready to make changes. And that's, that's what separates the guys that, you know, can, that are champions versus guys that might get lucky and win once, which I've only won once too, but I'm hoping I'm going to steer the other direction. <laughs> oh, I, I, I think it's going to happen. I think, I think, uh, I think it's going to happen. Uh, just in watching this year, you had a, had a good shot. And, and I think, I just think that that's going to happen. As we speak, uh, you're getting ready to head down to Texas. It's a very exciting time of the year. It's usually earlier in the year than this, but uh, it's Bassmaster Classic time. What, uh, what's the preparation been like? Yeah, I'm, I'm excited. I mean, the, the class is obviously the biggest event, event of the year, and um, I thought it was going to be in March kind of when I went and did my scouting, um, but the big thing there is at, at Ray Roberts, it, it's so so vast with timber and there's no trails, so a lot of my scouting was just figuring out how to get around. That way I can, you know, when I get down, I can focus on the fish, so I'm excited about getting over there, and, and right now it's just, you know, trying to get, staying in the swing of things. I've been home. Our schedule's been crazy. I mean, we've been gone, I think, because they jammed everything in the spring this year, maybe in, in in case they had to reschedule or whatever. I don't, oh, yeah. I don't know the reason, but we've never been done in July, but we're going to be done in July this year. And it has been busy. I've been gone like 27 days then home five then gone a month and home seven then gone 25. I mean, it's just, it's been a lot. So good news is, is we're fishing a lot right now and it, that's clicking going well. And I feel like I'm kind of in the groove. And uh, so we're, we're ready to go catch them. I just got to kind of get dialed in, but you know, watching the water levels a little bit over there and the water's up, you know, two to three feet uh, from full pool there. So it's, it's a little high and uh, maybe it'll come down. I, I like, I like when water's coming down, it kind of positions the fish, but just ready to get the tackle dialed in and get down there and get to work. You, you know, uh, it's always interesting, you know, obviously what, what the angler has to do to get ready to go, but, but you, you know, it's not just fishing for yourself. You've got a long list of sponsors that you work with and they want to make sure that, that, that they have all their signage and things like that in place with you what what has that been like i mean are there constant deliveries at the uh, at the pipkins household or or, yeah. or is all, that stuff already taken care of no there's always deliveries some are for me some are for sponsor stuff but yeah there's lots of things coming and going and, and the big thing is you know you're fishing for a living um but it's not like it used to be it's not where you just go fish and that and that's it i mean that's honestly that's a quarter of the job now there's just so many other ways and there's so many other expectations and that's why the fishing industry has grown so much because of the YouTube stuff, because of the TV, because of Instagram, social media, Facebook, like that's why the platforms are so big, but they're only big if you use them. So like the big thing with the classic, which it, there's a fine line because you want to go there and just focus on fishing, which is, is the main goal. But you also need to go there and focus, like you said, for the people that pay you, you need to be there and, and have some plans, you know, just for some simple posts, you know, while you're practicing, because it's, it's the time of the year. Whereas the, there's the most eyes on you. So you want to have your stuff, you know, in good shape. You, you want to have some ideas and you want to be active on social media while you're still putting your attention to fish. I mean, number one objective is focus on fishing, but you got to either have some help or, or do some of the other stuff while you're there to maximize, you know, your, your sponsor's exposure as well. So it's just, it's, it's always, it's like anything else. It's just balance and you got to 
do some juggling for sure. Does your global action camera give you the option to change lenses? Mine does. Tacticam's fisheye camera allows me to modify my viewing angle so I can film an extra wide or mini zoom. Tacticam fisheye, because that fish of a lifetime happens once in a lifetime. So uh, you mentioned that you've been to Ray Roberts. How, how have you been there many times or have you just been down there one time or how, how often have you been? Yeah, just once. The cool thing about that, a lot of the places we go, um, you know, Bass mixes in some new, new venues too, but a lot of the places, you know, they have such a tournament base and there's such a base of knowledge where you go and everybody, you know, does research and, and looks at the same things and finds, you know, similar sections of lake. So sections can get crowded or whatever. I'm um, not in a bad way, but just places where things usually go down. But Ray Roberts really doesn't have a lot of mainstream tournaments on it. So they have some of the Texas Fest, uh, I think like the whatever those team team events where there's some of those down there. But outside of that, I mean, it, it's fairly wide open with just kind of being a new venue. So when I went down, I think it was in December, I just went down and basically scouted. I wanted to learn how to get around. I spent 15 or 20 hours, I think, on um, uh, Google Earth. You know, you, you can draw the water down I, from, a, I think it was in 2015 when it was like six or seven feet low. And I took time in every little creek and plotted points like, you know, safe trails, like an airplane, airplane here, here, then a stop sign here where I need to stop. Because there's, there's a lot of places where like it, it's all flooded everywhere, but there's places where maybe it used to be a cornfield or like something that's flat or it was just bushes. So you can run that. There's other sections that are all like high standing timber and some of it's there, some of it's cut, you know, and it was neat to put some marks on things like you got an area you think you can run and there's three big trees and I mark those trees and you go down there, it's pretty cool. You're on water, but then like I can literally see right where my waypoints are, they're right on those trees from Google Earth. And so then you can, I know I can literally run right in between those trees, which if you didn't take the time to do that, when you go on a practice, you're going to be idling for miles and miles. So now I can, I can run in and out of places, you know, hopefully safely <laughs> and still, you know, spend my time graphing, you know, and spending time in the right places looking for fish, not just how to navigate, you know, it's a big, big part of the game. That that's a really big deal. I mean, you, you know, you, the, the time we talked to Edwin Evers about this and the time you spend with Google earth and what you can do. And, and there's so many different pictures. I mean, there's low, there's low water, there's high water, what a valuable thing to have and to be able to put that into your electronics uh, as waypoints or, or not waypoints, but, but navigation points, that's pretty valuable. Yeah. And in some places it plays a bigger role than others. And, you know, like a lot of places, it's just about having an idea how the lake lays out, you know, you, the, the hummingbird like map create stuff and their, uh, their charts are phenomenal. So when you go to places where it's just a mainstream lake, that's been then graphed, it's really easy to do your homework, just, sitting behind your graph, spending some time, like getting a game plan. But then there's places that are super vast. But the big thing is the timber places that aren't marked. If you can figure out, you know, what's where when the water's up and down, I mean, you can spend a lot of time. You can find, I mean, I found a lot of nice shallow, shallow brush piles. And I was excited about some of that. That's the water was down six feet in the picture. And like, let's say it was March and it was up five or six feet. Well, a lot of those giants are going to be sitting in those brush piles and four to six feet waiting to stage to come up. And I spent a lot of time marking some of that. And I just, I don't think that's that kind of stuff's going to play as much, but it was still benefiting just, you know, graphing and figuring out how to get around for sure. You know, one of the things that, that the classic, it, it, you mentioned it already is, is the distractions. Um, first of all, are you guys required to stay at the like, headquarters hotel or can you stay anywhere you want? You can stay where you want. Um, you do go to the, uh, the way it's laid out is we practice Friday through Sunday and Monday and Tuesday are off limits uh, for media day, like media things and whatever. Yeah. And then Wednesday is the official day of practice. And then we have our banquet stuff. So most everybody stays at the hotel on Wednesday night because it's a really nice dinner and kind of people hang out and, you know, celebrate a little bit on Wednesday. And then Thursday we do like the walkthrough and kind of prep tackle and stuff. And then, you know, you make that long drive back out on Friday. Some guys, it's probably a split. Some guys stay at the hotels and some guys, you know, have a house out at the lake or whatever. So, well, that, that brings me to the next thing is, is the, is the, is, what will you be doing? I should be asking you that. Yeah. And in the years past, I've always stayed at the hotel that Bass does a good job. You know, they put us up there, which is nice. Um, so I'll stay out at the lake during practice. Nobody has our stay, you know, that Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, we stay out there. And then starting Monday is when we have our stay at the actual hotel. Um, and usually I, I start staying out there then. And my, my plan this time was, 
you know, it's about an hour drive. If the tournament was launching at seven, I was, I was like, no problem. I'm going to stay at the hotel. I can get up at four 30, you know, leave by five, five. Yeah. That's plenty of time, but it's a later event. It's not in March anymore. So we have earlier lights and now we're taking off at six 15. So that kind of puts me on the bubble. I'm like, gosh, you really got to be up at four o'clock and, and, and you need to be out the door, you know, at, you know, four 15 and four 30 at the latest. So it's one of those where it's kind of like, I'd like to stay out the lake. I might, I'm probably going to end up doing the first practice day, stay at the hotel, see how it feels getting up that early. As long as you can, you know, get some sleep and get to bed at nine o'clock, I don't mind getting up at four and, and doing that. But it's just when you're up a little later and you leave earlier, it just can be tough. <laughs> Well, then you got guys like me that want to interview interview you there after you get off the water. I know there's a there's a daily press conference and there's the show, of course. Um, that stuff can take away a lot of valuable time. Yeah, and the nice thing about like if you're staying at the lake is you can knock out those interviews on your way back out to the lake. Either way, you got to make that drive. But if you're making that drive at like six o'clock at night, knocking out interviews, it's nice. Then you can get back, eat dinner, get your stuff ready, and you get that extra hour of sleep in the morning. So the hard part is when you're staying at the hotel. You're trying to knock out those interviews there. You just, you really got to make sure you get to bed a little earlier. So, I, and I don't mind being up early, jamming in the morning, like listening to the radio, kind of kicking back, getting focused like that. I'll eat my breakfast in the car and we'll be good to go doing that too. So, Like a, like a lot of pros these days, uh, you you produce a lot of YouTube content. Uh, Chad Pipkin's Fishing uh, is, is the channel. Um, you've been in this long enough now. Do you feel like this is something that a pro has to do or is this something that, a pro should do or it's okay if they don't what, what how do you feel about that it, it's beginning to be more mainstream like I, I don't do near what other guys do I, I do it because I feel like I should I don't have I've got a good following on Instagram and Facebook but I do not have a good following on YouTube it, it's a hard code to crack the, the YouTube is a totally different marketing thing so I just kind of sprinkle it in you know because it, it helps with sponsor stuff with the other thing that's my main main deal with that like so I'm not trying to you know, do what some of the other guys do. It's just, it's hard to do. You have to have to have such, such a following. And then those guys, the guys that are really good at it. I mean, they've got a full-time camera guy. They got a full-time editing or multiple people. And it shows on, on the productions they put out, they're phenomenal. So I feel like you have to do it to some extent. You definitely got to be on Instagram and Facebook and start, you know, doing some video work there and, and, and just make sure you're capturing stuff. I mean, that, that's the reason why people follow you. They're, they're excited about what you do for a living and they would love to be in your show shoes. So what better way to put them in your shoes besides showing them the content? It's not just fishing. It's the lifestyle, Matt. And that's what people, you know, are drawn to and they feel like they can relate to you, you know? So you got to do it to some extent for sure. If you're good, especially now, as we progress forward, it's getting even more like right now we're kind of on the bubble where you're seeing guys that don't do it and do it. But as we get another, you know, four or five, six years down the road, the less guys that didn't do it before they're retiring or they're, you know, they're done, you know, so that's, it's definitely heading that way. Uh, so now we work with Tacticam on this show. It, it, they're one of our one of the our our partners, and I know that they work with you as well. And so one of the things that we that at least I'm always drawn to is how different pros have their cameras set up in their boat. It seems to me like you've got a a fishing camera and a landing camera. Is that how you have it set up? And how you, how you just have them crossed on the boat there? Or what do you have them set up? Yeah. And it's, it's, it's the same thing like the classic part. Like the main thing is you, to land the fish. That's the number one priority. So you don't want to be out fooling with too many things. But that's the nice thing about the Tacticams. Like Bass has a rule right now. We actually have to have one running and it has to have full view of the boat and the live well. Just in case there's any discrepancies, you can go back to that video. So I have one that I, I don't use for anything, but I keep it at a really low resolution and I keep it in the, um, the light pole. It's like the, the TH mount that goes to yeah. the back. So it's on, it's charging the whole time and running, capturing everything that, that's needed for my requirements. And then for me, my cameras, I run, I do run two at the dash and I run one pointing forwards. And I run that one on all, at all times. That one's always on. And you know, that way it's, it's not missing anything. I don't have to touch it if I don't want to, if I want to, if something cool happens, I want to mark it, I can tap it and it'll, it'll kind of loop over that little feature there and save that. And then the one that's to the left, I used to run a remote which is really nice because you can do multiple cameras now, you know, having the marshals and stuff there before there, you know, I have the one pointed forward and the one kind of up or just getting that landing. Every time I land a big one, I like to land in that passenger seat. It's lower to the water. It's the most stable place in the boat. You see guys on the front of the boat leaning over the boats, rocking up and down. It's the biggest distance from the boat to the water and it's the hardest place to land. 
So I, I try to do a good job of getting the fish tired and that's kind of my sweet spot. So I just, you know, talk to my marshals beforehand and see if they're okay with just touching the button there. And that way you get, you get some cool stuff. I've had a couple of times, you know, having a big one on a giant crankbait and the fish is freaking out and you have a picture of this fish. It's like slow motion, the crankbait, you're like, you got one hook and this crankbait just whipping around and you watch the video in slow-mo and you don't even know how, how you landed it, but it's, it catches some neat stuff and some bad stuff, some heartbreaking stuff. Well, I think that that's, that's one of the things that I noticed on your, on your YouTube channel is you, you have a landing camera it, but you have you actually have the 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 bass marshal is actually turning that camera on for you then. Yeah, and he has this year more than before last year. We didn't have one, so I still I, I have a the nice thing about the tag cams is they've got a remote and you can yeah. link the any of them. So I'd have my shoulder cam sometime linked and my uh, my uh, landing area camera linked, and I just have a I have the remote right down by my foot. So again, main thing is hooking the fish and making sure you get them in the boat. But once I hook the fish, I get control of them if they're digging a little bit. I let them dig a little, you know, I just go down and touch the button. Obviously if the line's coming up at all, or if anything could happen, I'm not messing with the remote. So it's just about making sure that you get the fish in the boat and then you get it on fail. <laughs> you know, that, that is, that is really cool. I I'm familiar with that, but I have not, I don't feel like I'm coordinated enough to be able to be doing all those things at one time. If I can get that fish in the boat, I'm, <laughs> that's pretty impressive. I gotta tell you. Yeah, you, got, you got to know your limits. So make sure you, yeah, as long as you get the fish in the boat, that's the main thing. But now, nice now using multiple cameras implies that uh, you're doing some editing. Are you, are you comfortable with that? Is that something that you've had to learn or. Yeah. And I wear a few hats. I run some other business stuff at home with some rental properties and, and painting stuff. So I, I, I was wanting to learn actually how to do the editing and I'm like, yeah. I am absolutely overwhelmed. Like I do too much as it is. Um, but the only thing I do know how to do, which is nice is, is the, the clipping and editing. Like I don't edit it. I just at least trim and I pull the clips out. Cause it's funny when you fish, like I know every place I got bit. I know, I know the order of everything. I know you remember every single detail. So when I'm going through the clips, I can go super quick and I know where the fish catches are. That would take somebody else literally, you know, multiple hours. And for me, I can go through a day's fishing and buzz through in a matter of, you know, 15, 20 minutes, I can chop down and I'll clip all the clips I need, put them in a file. And my wife's gotten good at doing the editing so she can put together videos and stuff, which is nice because you can pay somebody, but it's nice to keep the money in the household. So absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Some of us that do podcasts are learning how to do this the hard way too. And, and it, yeah. you know, it's a good skill to have. I mean, I mean, you can, you can do some pretty cool stuff once you get dialed in. Especially now, I mean, like more things are going that way. And even if we don't do a bunch on YouTube, it's still nice to have the videos because this year we're done in July. So yeah. I've got a bunch of stuff saved. And my plan this year is if I don't do a bunch of like full YouTube videos for those, I'm just going to do shorter clips, but just to highlight different things. Maybe it's a bait, maybe it's a rod I'm using that I can overlay some music and maybe some talking with, look at the bend on this, the, the rod, or look, this is the crankbait I'm using or topwater. So that way we can you know, have, have some relevant stuff all throughout the season that people can, can appreciate. I've, I've actually got some footage of you that, that apparently you've shared with, with Tacticam because we've used it on our show in uh, commercial spots of you catching a fish, a frog fish, a big frog fish. I don't, I don't know where it was. One of the really grassy lakes down South, I think. I think it was but, Chickamauga. And it, yeah. I, wasn't, I was catching them on a big crankbait and off the bank on a little crankbait and a jerkbait and stuff. And that just went just away and it was horrible. I, I didn't have a fish and it was like one o'clock. I went back around the ramp at Chickamauga. I had like three good bites and that was the first one. It was like, I think it was a five, five, one that I caught. It was, it was a good bite. Come on! Yeah, we got one. One of the right ones. It only took 17 hours. Get to turn the live well on. Hot dog. Yeah, that, that was just that was that was one of the first things I saw with Tacticam and how clear that was. That was a good good picture. Yeah. Hey, I wanted to ask you, uh, Douglas J Salons. It, it may not be the most <laughs> conventional bass fishing sponsor. But I, I tell you, um, there's one in my neighborhood 
and I drive by it several times a week now. And every time I do, I think, God, that's Chad Pipkins, Douglas J right there. That's Douglas. I wanted to know, how did that come together for you? Yeah, that's funny. I mean, the, the big thing in our industry is there's a lot of unique companies like the fishing. I don't want to say the fishing industry is, I don't mean polluted bad. I just mean there's a lot of people fighting for the same dollars. Oh, and yeah. Similar yeah. Things. But if you can think outside the box, and, and I've worked with another company, Bed Gear, you know, they provide, you know, bedding, obviously, the Tacticam stuff. And there's just, there's a really big market and people outside the fishing industry do have an advertising budget and there's unique ways to use it. So it's not like everybody that watches me is going to go get a Douglas J haircut right away, but we do a lot of fun things together. They have a budget and we do like a fundraiser for juvenile diabetes. We do another one for Susan B. Coleman. We do another one for um, uh, the Alliance for Great Lakes. We did a -a fish-a-thon. We do stuff like that where we work together to raise funds for other people. Like they're already doing those things and that way they can utilize me, you know, to help kind of maximize some of that stuff. So it's just one of those things where the longer you're in the game, the, the more networking that has been done. That's anytime I speak to college or high school kids, I'm like, I'm not saying use your connections, like use people, but you, you know, use the connections you have to build relationships and work with people that want to be around you. The more that the, that people get along with you, the more opportunities you're going to have to like build these bridges and, and, and figure out how to make things work. And that's been fun. I've been with these guys, you know, uh, I met them through, I work nights and weekends, ref and ice hockey. And one of the owners, um, Scott Weaver, I met him through playing a bunch of hockey. And I had a friend that worked for him. And, you know, then he's like, man, we got to hook you up with some highlights, maybe get some, some decals on the boat and help you out a little bit. And I think the year after that, I won the open points and made the elite series. And we started to talk and we figure out how to make it work. And it's, this is nine years later, you know, they're still one of the biggest supporters I have. So it's pretty, pretty special. Well, yeah, that's such a great story. And, and you know, that that's the thing. People of all walks of life like to fish and, you know, you might not associate hair care products or, or, or a yeah. salon with bass fishing, but I'm telling you, I drive by that place. I'm probably not the candidate that they're <laughs> looking for, but, but, you know, I know there's people out there like me that, 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 uh, that need that kind of, that kind of treatment and uh, <laughs> it's connections. Yeah, it is. And it's just another way it's, it's brand recognition and familiarity with things. And, you know, just, it's, it's, it's fun and unique that you can do things like that. And that's what makes our sport getting it. I don't want to say it's more special, but now because of all the media and all the Facebook and Instagram, there's more marketing opportunities like that than ever. So that's why you see these guys fishing the opens and it's expensive to fish though. And I, every time I see it, I'm like, you gotta be kidding. Like every, when I did it, I didn't have a rat boat. Like I hustled nights, weekends, I saved all my money to, to, to try to make it, you know? Yeah. And now I see guys, these guys are ready and they're coming off. They've already got title deals that are ready to dump money into them fishing elite series because they know like the visibility that, you know, comes with some of that. So they got fully rat boats and trucks and, you know, it's just, it's pretty neat to see that now. And it's because of all the eyes and the social stuff we got going. Yep. Yep. So you're currently sitting in 42nd place. That's a little below the cut line for the uh, classic next year. It's hard to believe we're talking about the classic next year, but, yeah, close. but you're, but you're, but, but the, the elite series is moving to a Northern swing uh, and, and it's going to some places that you've had some success on. What, what are your thoughts about the uh, last couple of events? Yeah, I feel, I feel great about where I'm at now. I'd like to be higher, obviously. Um, I think I'm actually in 30, like this year, cause of COVID we had a stipulation, you know, if there was one person with COVID that finishes the year, we, everybody gets to drop one. So with that, I finished 94th, I think in, uh, uh, at Sabine and I'm actually in, I would drop that. And it would move me up to like 39th or so. Oh, so wow. I'd, be, I'd be right where I need to be, except it's just it, anybody that follows what I've done with the opens and stuff. I mean, it's just, I haven't yet transferred a full season in the elites and I've done it so many times in the opens. It's only three or four events, but I've won angle of the year twice. I think I finished fourth, fifth, sixth, 10th, 11th, like, and you're talking about hundreds of guys. And I've yet to make that, that full elite series season. And like last year you saw, I was in at the beginning of the year, I was in eighth place after four or four or five events. And we didn't really have a big, swing of north we finished all down south last year and i messed up the middle i had three finishes in the 80s then finished like a top 10 and 18 the last one i had in 2015 i think i finished third fourth and fifth at the end of the year but i've never strung eight events together and i'm so close that's that's what i need to break through to you know to have that shot and to be in the top 10 or top five in the points and i just i just lacking like one or two events for consistency so like i feel really good about where i'm at but I still look at it. I'm like, Oh my goodness. I had a good practice at Sabine. 
I finished 94th. And then I had one other one where I got just a small check. I think I finished 70th, but if you could kind of reshuffle those, I mean, like I could be right in the mix, you know, and it's, so it's, it's bittersweet, but still fishing well, making good decisions. And I'm ex- always excited to go North, especially still being in, you know, within the cut right now. So, yeah. Okay. Well, that, 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 that's, that's pretty exciting. Uh, you know, it's hard, it's hard, it's hard to think that the elite series is going to be over at the end of June. Um, uh, it just, uh, like we, you mentioned it maybe because of COVID that they, they did it this year, but that's uh, what's going to happen the rest of the year. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we've only got, we've got the classic in June here, then we've got two events in New York and, and we're done. So I've never been done, done in July in my life. And then I've got one other open in July. And then uh, I think the only other open I have is in September. So for me, what's going to happen is, I'm going to relax for a minute at least and, you know, get some other stuff done. I've got some sponsor trips to people that I owe that we'll be doing on like Lake Erie, Lake St. Clair in the fall, you know, do some of that. Cause obviously we didn't get a lot of that done last year and then kind of really prep for last year or for, for even next year. Cause last year it was just a rollover. I literally pulled the stuff out of my boat, cleaned the boat up really quick. Boat was sold, picked up the new boat the same day, dropped it off to get wrapped, got it rigged through tackling, tried to re-rig and it was time to go to Florida. I mean, it was, it was like that. So this year I really need to, I'm big on simplicity and minimizing like the, the tackle that you have. You want to have what you know you need, um, but there's so much stuff that just can be a clutter. Like I know what I like to do. I don't need 50 colored crankbaits of this and that. I need a few different colors. And I want to have a little bit of everything in the boat and have the stuff that I'm confident in. I'd really just want to kind of clean up and downsize and keep it simple. So I've been doing that a little bit each year, the last three or four years. And I really think it's helped. It just, you know, helps you make decisions and, head head forward. Hey, one of the things I like to ask uh, people on when I interview them is, is to def- talk about defining moments. Have you got a pivotal moment in your career where you, yeah. you, well, you felt me, like it was all coming together or it, it, it changed your direction or something or what, you went from maybe not being super serious about it to being, making it a career. Is there, is, was it the, was it the open win maybe, or that's like, I mean, that's definitely a good one because I just, I know like that was the first classic I ever made too. And I think that year I finished 53rd or fourth in the point. So I just missed the angle of the year championship, but like I was making strides to make the right stuff happen. And then to win that the last event of the season to make my first classic. And then after that, you know, it was 2015. And then I, I finished like 20 something in the points and the elites had made my second classic in a row. So like, I feel like the combination of those kind of said, to my sponsors and the people that I was with, you know, like I'm, I'm here to stay for a while. And, and this is legitimate. Cause the big thing with what we do is, you know, seven to 10 new guys come in every year. So seven to 10 go out. I mean, so there's a high turnover, which people don't really see because you don't see the guys that are in 60th to a hundredth. You see the same, you know, right. 20 or 30 guys. So you just assume everybody's the same, but there's a lot of cycling and people don't want to invest money or time with you, you know, until they have an idea that you're going to, you know, be around a little longer. So I felt like, for me, that really said, you know, I was here to stay a little bit. And um, I just, I'm just lacking that elite series win now. That, that's, that's what I need to kind of say, let's, you know, let's keep, let's keep rolling. Well, I'm sure it's going to happen. Uh, Chad Pipkins, thanks a lot for being with us. Uh, we're going to be watching closely at the, at the classic this next week. Uh, best of luck to you. And, and uh, we'll talk to you again down the road sometime, maybe after the classic win, huh? I like the sound of that. I hope I have a big trophy back here somewhere and uh, a big giant check that I'll be, Holding up, maybe. Don't give me. Looking forward to it. All right. Thanks for being with us. We'll talk to you again soon. I appreciate it. All right.